Some dare call it conspiracy. Welcome to the Some Dare Call It Conspiracy podcast, hosted by Brent Lee and Neil Sanders. After nearly 20 years exploring the world of conspiracy culture, we are taking our guests and listeners on a guided tour of the rabbit hole. Our mission, to discover where the truth lies. Hey, it's, it's uh, Neil Sanders here from Some Day I Call It Conspiracy. And I was asked to write an article for the fabulous comic, Children of the Headache. I didn't really know what to do, so I watched some David Icke, and then I wrote my thoughts on it. So here it is. When I was recently asked to write something for Children of the Headache, I was chuffed. That's very cool, I thought, only for a slight wave of panic to wash over me. What the bloody hell am I actually supposed to write? Now, some of you might know me and know that I'm often difficult to shut up, so it irked me that I was drawing a blank. Hey, look, there's a comic book pun at no extra cost. So I did something that I haven't done for a long time. I sat down and I watched some David Icke. For those who don't know, Ike is an ex-footballer and BBC sports pundit that had a revelation breakdown in the mid-90s that included invisible presences, voices in his head, meetings with spiritualists, a turquoise shell suit, multiple living lovers, premonitions of the world's end in 1997 and the announcement on national television that Ike was in fact the son of God. In 1998, he first spoke of his magnificent octopus, or magnum opus, the idea that the most prominent, famous or wealthy people, including Henry Kissinger, the Bush family and the UK royal family, were in fact reptilian aliens from the Draco constellation that could shapeshift into human form. He in no way copied this from the TV series V, or from the books of Robert E. Howard, or from an episode of Doctor Who, despite his theories being identical in content. And any suggestion that his theory simply cribs from these previously existing sources is obviously wrong. It's just a complete coincidence. For several years, I was actually quite a fan of Ike. The first time I watched a lecture by him, I did it purely to rip the piss, but was surprised to find a calm, seemingly rational person providing what looked like evidence of some rather out there but interesting ideas. While some of it was patently nonsense, some of it, on the surface, at least sounded plausible. Now, as the years went on, though, more and more wacky stuff was introduced into his spiel. Topics such as the moon being a space station beaming reality to the planet and the world being run by a secret Jewish cult called Sabatian Frankis became his stock topics. Then COVID happened. This was when he really got on my nerves. In early 2020, Ike decided that COVID simply didn't exist. He promoted the work of a conman failed psychiatrist named Andrew Kaufman, who stated that viruses themselves don't exist. Kaufman's lies gave comfort to legions of idiots during the pandemic, who sent him a shit ton of money that he promptly spent on a hair transplant. Ike also claimed that the 5G phone network was probably the cause of all this illness, and he actually nicked this from another conman named Thomas Cowan. And he started spouting absolute bullshit about tests for the virus not working. A test that doesn't test for the test, was his somewhat insensible mantra on the subject. Now, I personally know vulnerable fans of David who put themselves in dangerous situations and got ill after following his stupid advice. I wouldn't be surprised if his silly attention-seeking contrarianism actually killed people. He also did several interviews with piss-drinking pyramid scheme enthusiast Brian Rose, who runs the terrible London Real website. Rose is a man who conned his followers into paying for a website that he got hosted for free and all the time whilst pretending that he was a billionaire. So I'd avoided Ike for a while, but needs must. So I tuned in to his Dot Connector show about the fake alternative media, which was apparently irking Ike, who was in no way bitter about other people's success. He was simply concerned that he wasn't getting the recognition, attention and support that he felt entitled to. The show opened with an advertisement for products to get rid of chemtrails, which are not a real thing, and how to utilise sovereign law, an idea that most law don't actually apply to people, which is also not a real thing. Off to a good start, I thought. 
David starts by saying that Russell Brand and Jordan Peterson are rushing to pick a side in the recent Israel-Palestine conflict. If you pick a side, you start to become an apologist for that side, warns Ike. Because of not understanding reality. Straight off the bat, I thought this was rich, coming from a man who spent the last three years telling everybody that the worldwide pandemic was fake and had stuck stubbornly to his bullshit in spite of the overwhelming evidence that he was incorrect. This is a man who has literally ignored reality. This is a man telling us that George Soros, Bill Gates and others are part of an evil satanic cult that we need to resist at all costs, who is now telling us not to pick a side. He is a man who has his own private booth inside the VIP area of his own specially vetted echo chamber. He then says that it is better to judge someone's behaviour and not pick a side. But surely the behaviour would dictate if he wanted to join that side. And furthermore, the behaviour of alleged rapist Brand and serial liar and exploiter of lonely men Peterson is also generally appalling. This is not touched on, and it gets less and less coherent as the interview progresses. David then explains that this cult, Sabbatian Frankists, secretly rule the world, which is his latest thing. He actually cribbed this from an obscure conspiracy theorist named Rabbi Antleman, who released a book on the theory titled To Eliminate the Opiate in 1974. The theory is that anti-Jewish hatred is actually promoted by a secret set of Jews that want to introduce a world communist state. They aren't really Jews, so it can't be anti-Semitic. However, they all do happen to be Jewish. It's basically a have-your-cake-and-eat-it-too version of the New World Order World Jewish Conspiracy with a layer of secret Jews, which apparently means that this isn't anti-Semitic. However, other than David Icke, the person who has promoted this theory the most is ex-KKK leader David Duke, which obviously leaves somewhat of a bad taste in one's mouth. David Icke has always denied accusations of anti-Semitism. However, he has dallied with Holocaust denial, he has promoted the Protocols of Zion as a real and accurate document, and he talks about the Rothschilds controlling all banks and financing all wars since they took over the Bank of England shortly after the Battle of Waterloo. The Protocols were invented by agents of the Russian secret police to persecute Jews and are a complete fabrication. Most of the canards against the Rothschilds actually come from the Nazi-produced film Die Rothschild, a propaganda piece designed to persecute Jews. The idea that the Rothschilds took controlling interests in the Bank of England following the Battle of Waterloo is also fiction. It came from the fictional Satan pamphlet written by anti-Semite Matthew Georges Dernval, which was also designed to persecute Jews. None of the accusations in any of these documents were true, and neither is the idea that the Rothschilds family have financed both sides of every war since Waterloo, but Ike promotes all of these as fact. In his defence, when Ike says reptiles, this is not a euphemism for Jews. He genuinely believes in extraterrestrial reptiles. David then transitions into a rant about the woke, those concerned with civil rights and equality, saying that the woke will always pick a side. He gives examples, COVID being real, climate change being real, the invasion of Ukraine. He doesn't specify what exactly about the invasion the woke are wrong about, but they are definitely, definitely wrong. After chastising the woke for picking a side, he heavily implies that they are incorrect in their views and that the correct opinion is that of the other side, which he happens to belong to. He then states that the woke are being played like a spring instrument, I think in fairness he meant string. Jamie, his son, who is interviewing him, makes the point that Hamas and the IDF are essentially exactly the same. The reasoning? They both encourage people to take the vaccine against COVID in Palestine and Israel respectively. Thinking about this, these similarities run much deeper. They both promote eating, breathing, sleeping, and I presume have similar ideas about day and night, up and down, and the colours black and white. And if that isn't total proof of some overarching secret alien cult being in control, I don't know what is. That's a great point, David concedes, before sandbagging his son and taking credit for it himself. I said that on social media earlier this week. David then segues into his main bone of contention, the mainstream alternative. They get a big audience, he says, with no hint of bitterness. He is referring to people like Russell Brand, Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, Lawrence Fox and others, who most would label as alt-right. Now here, Ike has touched on something true. 
but only by accident. In the past few years, members of the alt-right have embraced the conspiracy crowd. This is simply because they saw a demographic that was ripe for fleecing. They witnessed the anger, resentment and yearning for answers in a large number of people and they took advantage of this. The method is to imply that there is an existential threat to the viewer that they have no power over and to tell them that you support them. This existential threat could be foreigners, the WEF, environmental concerns, trans people, Democrats, black people or any number of things that terrify the ill-informed. Say a couple of buzzwords and the audience will eat out of your hand. They started with Gamergate, manipulating like-minded individuals to a cause that unites them, then Brexit via Cambridge Analytica, then the election of Trump, and then pandering to people's annoyance at restrictions caused by COVID. However, the tactic is actually a lot older than that. It originally came from the religious think tank, the John Birch Society, as so many conspiracies do. Primarily, they were concerned that there was a secret plot to turn the world communist ran by shadowy figures in a secret cabal. Roger Ailes, a John Birch member, wanted to popularise the Tea Party political movement. The problem was most people saw it as absolutely batshit crackers. So he introduced a new presentation style to Fox News, Opinions and Characters. People like Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, Tucker Carlson and others would offer opinions on existential threats facing the viewer. The purpose was to cause anger. Anger is addictive. It causes a chemical response in your brain similar to gambling. People get this buzz from being angry, and so they seek out things that will annoy them. Through this tactic, Fox was not only able to garner a loyal and furious fan base, but also popularise the paranoid ramblings of the John Birch Society and Tea Party movement. Similar tactics were used to bolster a seething support for Brexit and later an outraged army of Trump fans. The problem is that this was also cultivated by the conspiracy crowd. Aside from the far-right canards about George Soros, the Rothschilds, or other Jews ruling the world, the conspiracy crowd are also suspicious of immigration, Black Lives Matter, trans people, and have a penchant for Holocaust denial. Other fascist ideas such as hierarchies of people, we like the gays but not the trans, and thinking of countries as organisms that can be infected by outside influence are also rife in the conspiracy crowd. Recently, seeing as these alt-right shits have drawn a big crowd, David and others have attempted to co-opt back some of the audience. They also pandered to the far right in an attempt to claim some of their fans as their own. This has included Ike providing a platform for arseholes such as Tommy Robinson and Katie Hopkins, and others such as Alex Jones promoting Nick Fuentes, Milo Yiannopoulos, and entertaining the insane Hitler-praising rants of Kanye West. Rich Planet promoted Holocaust denying Nick Colostrom and German new medicine that postulates that you can only get cancer if a Jew injects it to you. Richie Allen platforms far-right activists such as Mark Collette. Although there may be hints of ideological overlap, my opinion is that it is more to do with getting a wider audience than anything else. For a time in the conspiracy world, it was very fashionable to think that maybe Hitler had had rather a rough deal of it all. Racism and bigotry is tolerated by the alternative media under the banner of free speech, particularly when it comes to Israel and Jews. Recently, this bigotry has been directed at immigrants with concerns of secret armies of fighting aged men poised to overtake the country and replace the poor maligned white population. Now the entire genre has shifted to the right and sometimes far right. But if you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. However, as the interview progresses, it becomes clear that Ike's personal gripe seems to be based in jealousy rather than in concerns about politics. Jamie says that Trump's election pulled the conspiracy crowd into politics, which is kind of true, but ignores earlier examples like Brexit. Ike fully supported Brexit and, at the time, encouraged people not to vote for Jeremy Corbyn, Labour, implying that you should vote for the Conservative government in order to get Brexit done. Ike says that Trump is a fraud because he promotes COVID vaccines, but does praise him for his hysterical, inaccurate, racist views on critical race theory. So there's something. Trump cleverly cultivated the conspiracy crowd by pretending to be anti-establishment. In reality, he's backed by think tanks such as the Heritage Foundation and the CNP, and you really can't get more establishment than that. Trump, like pretty much everyone else mentioned here, is simply using the conspiracy crowd to feather his own nest. The reason for David not getting the recognition that others do is obviously because of this secret cult. Of course it is. 
According to Ike, the cult own media outlets such as GB News, which purport to be anti-mainstream media, but are, as David describes, agents of here and no further. David says that they only go so far in revealing information about what's going on, giving the impression of being alternative, but really being a stooge. David goes all the way. An analogy would be that GB News are Blink-182, a pop act that gives the impression of rebellion, whereas David sees himself as the Sex Pistols, purer in message and better all round. The simpler explanation is that GB News are just shithouses, who play on the fears of gullible audiences presented in a similar manner to conspiracy theorists or identical to Roger Ailes' model of Fox News, if you want to be completely accurate. Hello, initiates of the Some Dare Call It Conspiracy podcast. Dom Jolly here. How are you? Sorry to butt in, but I just wanted to let you know that I've written, well, a book that I'm very, very proud of called The Conspiracy Tourist, in which I travel around the world taking a look at the weird world of conspiracies, and I think you might like it. Not only that, but I'm touring the book and doing live shows all around England from the 28th of Feb to the end of March. And it would be smashing to see you there. I think you'd like it. If you are interested, go to my website, www.domjolly.tv. And now, on with the podcast. Thanks. There is an irony here with Ike claiming GB News are a distraction from his real insights. It has long been said, that conspiracy theories such as Ike are considered useful idiots by governments around the world for focusing on ludicrous things. For example, if we are worried that the UK government is full of space lizards who want to kill you with a vaccine, we completely ignore real improprieties such as expense scandals, lack of help for the community and embezzlement of public funds. David then turns his critique to internet influencer and webcam pimp Andrew Tate saying that he only focuses on society's attacks on masculinity and the suppression of the male. When, oh when, will the straight white male ever catch a break? But in terms of the wider agenda, he hasn't got a clue. My chief concern with Tate wouldn't be that. I would focus on him being a terrible role model, a materialistic wanker, and most importantly, a pimp, a sex trafficker, and an alleged rapist. Ike seems more concerned that he gets a huge following, but doesn't talk about the stuff that Ike wants him to talk about. Ike is also somewhat peeved that Tate seems to have nicked his interpretation of the film The Matrix as an accurate portrayal of controllers harvesting negative energy from humans and limiting their potential, whilst keeping them in a false, augmented reality. Tate says that he was talking about The Matrix years ago, Ike says visibly angered. You don't even know what The Matrix is. Tate seems to think that the Matrix is some sort of behind-the-scenes faction determined to bring down strong men like him, though in all likelihood his downfall is far more to do with the women he exploited and prostituted going to the police. In reality, the Matrix is an action film that also works as an allegory for the experience of being trans, but Ike believes that it is literally a true representation of reality, but with robots instead of lizards. Ike then mentions Jordan Peterson, who he claims knows nothing about the big picture, and who, in a moment of peak irony, he accuses of commenting on things that he hasn't got a clue about. The main problem with Peterson is that he lies. It's the same tactic, scare the gullible with an existential threat to their way of life. In Peterson's case, it was Bill C-16, which he claimed meant that you could be imprisoned or fined for accidentally misgendering a person. The bill made no such claim, Peterson simply made it up. However, an army of men, confused and threatened by the progress of the modern world, took this fabrication as indicative that the culture war was real, and not the fevered imaginings of a bunch of terrified bigots. Ike then goes on to praise Tucker Carlson. Carlson has, for the majority of his career, spent his time as a paid liar and antagonist for the Fox News network, and is often financed by the Kochs. He is literally everything that Ike should be fighting against, And this leads one to wonder why he likes him so much. But then we get to the crux of Ike's gripe. All those previously mentioned, along with Ben Shapiro, have in some way leapt to the defence of Russell Brand, who has recently been accused of multiple counts of sexual assault and rape. Brand has recently conned a lot of people into thinking he is some sort of wise guru, concerned with spirituality and making the world better. He isn't. This is just a way to make money, 
but he mentions George Soros and he causes the audience awakening wonders, which is pretty much all you need for the conspiracy crowd to throw money at you these days, or in this case, figuratively drop their knickers for an accused rapist. Ike is angry that this group of people that he believes, quite rightly in some cases, have somewhat stolen his style, didn't jump to his defence when he was kicked off Twitter, or banned from Australia, or banned from 26 countries in the EU. Ike was banned from Australia for Holocaust denial, and from the EU because he planned to speak at a far-right rally. If I was cynical, and I am, I would suggest that I thought Ike tried to get kicked off Twitter by continuously posting things that he knew were against their terms of service. At the time, it was rather fashionable to do this in the name of free speech or some such nonsense. This would, of course, drive people to Ike's new pay-per-view internet channel, but I'm sure that was merely a happy coincidence. He then accuses Peterson of talking in word salads and Brand of using overly flowery language to conceal that he isn't actually that clued up. They actually say nothing, Ike claims, completely missing the pot kettle scenario that others may have picked up on here. Ike claims that the reason for shunning him is twofold. One, they simply aren't on his level and don't understand the enormity of what Ike is trying to convey. And two, the majority of people think that Ike is mad and any association with him could be damaging to their image. I think he's half right. Ike bemoans the Think Tank Arc, which is a quasi-religious think tank that promotes the fossil fuel industry. Not because of its connection to the fossil fuel industry, but because he sees it as controlled opposition. This is mainly because it is financed by Peter Marshall, who through his Legatum think tank, also financed by the Kochs, finances GB News, who Ike thinks don't go far enough with their far-right batshittery. Well, not far enough for him anyway. Interestingly, Peter Marshall got his start in the industry with a loan from George Soros, arch bogeyman of the conspiracy crowd. They tend to overlook this because GB News panders to their worldview, and because most people don't know this fact. The do-your-own-research crowd often isn't particularly great at doing their own research. Ike then praises far-right politician Ava Vladeringbroek for her stance on fighting the WEF on behalf of Dutch farmers. Recently, Dutch farmers have been told to reduce nitrogen emissions. This has got nothing to do with the WEF, but has been seized upon by the far right as an example of environmentalism gone mad. But he's sad that she's connected to ARC. Strangely, he isn't bothered at all about her far right politics or her anti feminist politics or her anti abortion politics or her anti immigration, anti Muslim, anti Semitic beliefs or the fact that she promotes the racist great replacement theory. Ike says that there is a lot of religion in the alt media and that religion again causes you to pick sides and view the world through the lens of that religion. This is again quite ironic as Ike himself rails against satanic practices and rituals supposedly carried out by the elites. Recently, Peterson has become very religious. Tate is Islamic. Ben Shapiro is not shy about his devotion to Judaism. And Alex Jones has claimed to have been chosen by God to be a trailblazer. Jones has told the story of how this mission came about many times. He was sat in a restaurant eating chicken fried steak when all of a sudden the room began to shake and a thousand foot eagle appeared in front of him. Jones understood the eagle to be God, who then downloaded massive amounts of information into Jones's brain. He has since said that one of the byproducts of this meeting was that he now completely understood how nuclear reactors worked, which is obviously handy. Alex Jones used to refer to Ike as the turd in the punch bowl because he felt that lizards made other conspiracies look daft by association. But since then, Alex has himself gone full-blown loony, uh, often talking about demons and interdimensional beings, so I assume they're probably best friends now. Ike, it must be remembered, used to claim to be the literal son of God. He made this claim on the Wogan TV show and then explained that he had the same messianic connection to God that Jesus did on the Late Late Show the following evening. Some revisionists tried to claim that Ike meant, oh, we're all children of God. And though he did say this, he clarified to interviewer Gay Byrne that he was the same as Jesus, an agent with a direct connection to the Godhead that was here to spread truth. It is not clear if Ike still thinks that he is the son of God, or if the eagle that Alex Jones saw bore any familiar resemblances to the Ikes. Ike then focuses on his main target, Joe Rogan. Ike is annoyed that Rogan refuses to interview him. 
He's also angry that when interviewing Russell Brand, the pair took the piss out of Ike and claimed that there was literally no evidence for his reptile aliens theory. Now, this isn't entirely true. There is a lot of hearsay and conjecture regards the theory, which are types of evidence, I suppose. This particularly annoyed Ike, as Russell Brand has formed for extracting the Michael from Ike. Previously, the pair were on good terms, then two incidents happened that Ike simply will not forgive. Firstly, Brand invited Ike onto his TV show Brand X, and went about putting pictures of prominent celebrities on the big screen, asking Ike who was and who wasn't a reptile. Later, Ike was invited onto Brand's radio show, where Noel Gallagher proceeded to mock Ike mercilessly, again asking if he and others that he knew were actually reptiles. Since then, Ike has spent much time on Twitter, calling Joe Rogan a coward and trying to goad him into interviewing him. This is all a pattern that some have suggested implies Ike is actually more concerned with getting attention from a large audience than telling the truth. In fact, that's what got him banned from Australia, refusing to acknowledge the Holocaust. The suggestion was that Ike didn't want to alienate the part of his audience that embraced Holocaust denial. He did a similar thing with Flat Earth, never saying that the world wasn't flat, rather hedging his bets to avoid losing an audience share. His next target is Elon Musk. Ike isn't cross that Musk is embracing far-right nonsense, or that he's turned Twitter into a total shower of shit. No, it's his popularity that irks David. He's just telling them what they want to hear, and... If we know that the deep state was dictating Twitter content, which it wasn't, then why did the same deep state allow Musk to buy Twitter? To Ike's chagrin, these characters all seem to be in with one another, and they all interview each other, whereas Ike is marginalised. Jamie says that from their experience, the wilder, more far-out, wacky theories get far more traction on the internet which may be why Ike has started talking about the reptiles much more often recently, having previously avoided them in favour of his Sabbatian Frankist theory. Jamie wonders if this here and no further group are there to stop people looking for the crazier theories, like a barrier to the truth. This makes no sense, as those seeking out the wackier stuff will still want that, and are hardly likely to be satisfied with the group's watered-down hysteria. They want the full bore lunacy. That's like saying, we know people like roller coasters, perhaps these treadmills here are to stop people going on roller coasters. However, David agrees that this is exactly what is happening. David, a man who believes that reptilian aliens are using an obscure Jewish cult to control the planet, who believes that Covid isn't real and doesn't exist, and who believes that the moon is a spaceship being reality to the planet, then warns the audience that religion is bad, as it comprises a belief structure. He goes on to say that the world is probably a simulation, that reincarnation is definitely real. I wonder why this topic appeals to the ageing Ike. And that scientists know nothing about the world, as the electromagnetic spectrum is only a tiny fraction of reality. He fails to see the irony that scientists discovered this and explained this to him, but hey-ho. He then implies that he knows better than all the scientists in the world, and says that we actually need humility to progress. Then the entire agenda is laid out. There is a non-human entity that feeds off negative emotion and ultimately controls the world. Their plans are to depopulate the planet, and this will be achieved through low sperm counts, low testosterone, and attacks on the family unit. This is also ironic for two reasons. Firstly, because during his turquoise period, Ike himself lived in a polyamorous relationship. This could hardly be considered traditional, can it? He started off fairly normally with a wife and three children, Then he discovered that he might be the son of God and thought, what would Jesus do? It was obvious. Start wearing turquoise shell suits, move another woman into the family home with her daughter and conduct a menage a trois. His wife put up with his nonsense until the second woman became pregnant and was kicked out. She and her now two daughters live a separate life to the Ikes. Later, Ike met a third woman who he began an affair with before he divorced his first wife Ike remarried, but this relationship soured when he became suspicious that his bride was, in fact, a reptilian alien in disguise. Secondly, because Ike seems to have a great relationship with his kids, there is an obvious and genuine respect and love between them. Ike's businesses used to be run exclusively by his children and first wife. His first wife and his second wife were even friends at one point. Ike is the poster boy for successful, unconventional family units. He himself shows that non-traditional family setups can work and prosper. It seems strange and a little sad 
that he slavishly promotes this trope about ideal family units. Ike says that this is why they're attacking Andrew Tate, because he promotes strong men. He's actually being attacked because he's a sex trafficking pimp and a rapist, and by all accounts, a wanker, not because he promotes strength. Also, being a pimp isn't promoting family values either. Ike doubles down, saying that Drag Queen Story Hour is there to confuse children and stop them from procreating to depopulate the planet. This raises questions. If there really is an alien entity that lives off our fear, is their best plan to depopulate the planet really to get some pantomime dames to read stories to children in the hope that they turn gay? That's a pretty drawn out plan, isn't it? Surely there must be a simpler way. I'm pretty sure that's not how sexuality works anyway. Furthermore, wouldn't the depopulation of the planet result in these aliens starving themselves? Where would they get all their delicious fear from then? How does this all stack up with the fact that the global population keeps rising year after year? If this alien life force has been banging away at this plan for years, why are they so terribly bad at it? Are they failing in their war against humanity despite the majority of people not even knowing that they exist? It just seems needlessly complicated. This reminded me of a conversation I had just the other day. The film Terminator was recently somewhat ruined by a good friend of mine. Well, what are friends for? He pointed out that if you were to think of the humans in the film as a mice infestation and as Skynet as a homeowner, then Skynet's plan in the film is stupid. What would you do if you had mice, Neil? He asked. Would you put down traps and poison Or would you build a sophisticated robot mouse, which looks like a real mouse on the outside, and use that to infiltrate the mice through gaining their initial trust and then killing them off one at a time? He's right, of course, but he's no longer allowed to watch films with me. He needlessly ruins something by being petty and pedantic. He spoiled it by over-scrutinising, nitpicking and pointing out the holes in the narrative, and I hate it when people do that. Some dare call it conspiracy. 